Apple a Day with Dr. Amanda. This podcast empowers people to use their voices, share their story, and provide wisdom in a variety of areas. And I'm lucky and fortunate to have Dr. Emily Sharp with me here today. If you're on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe if you like what you're seeing and hearing. Today, we will be talking about how to build reading skills. And I am so honored and delighted to have my friend and colleague, Dr. Emily Sharp, here today with me. And Emily and I met at Lehigh University, where we were doctoral students and obtained our doctorate degree and PhD in education. And so Emily has a really vast background. She is a certified English educator in grades 7 through 12th grade. She is also Wharton Gillingham tutor and training since 2001. She is certified in letters, a science of reading content. She is currently a consultant and trainer at uh, Colonial Intermediate Unit 20, myself. And Emily also teaches um, as an adjunct professor at Drexel University in the area of math, as well as Lehigh University in different special education areas. So Emily is definitely a vast of knowledge and research and she's going to be able to share with you, family, audience, educators, everybody out there, why it's so important. And I know she's so passionate about the science of reading and making sure every student has equitable access to learning how to read and learning how to read in the, the best manner for that individual student. So Emily, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Amanda. It's great to see you. It's great to see you too. I want to start, Emily, with you telling me about your background in understanding the science of reading. I started out in special education, working in vocational education, and a lot of the students that I had were special education students. Um, and that prompted me to get uh, a master's degree in special education. And of course, as soon as you start working with those kids, you realize that the uh, majority of them have reading difficulty. Mm -hmm. When I started in public schools, I had the opportunity to train. Uh, I was working in New York and I had the opportunity to train um, in Orton Gillingham with uh, Diana Hambury King and William Van Cleve from the Kildonan School in Amenia, New York. And I did that training and I did a practicum with William Van Cleve at that time. It was, they were putting up a lot of uh, uh, they were kind of gatekeeping on the Orton Gillingham certification. And so I heard from someone that I did training with there that uh, they were training people at Fairleigh Dickinson University and they were certifying people and I wanted that, that credential. So I went, I was already tutoring, had a tutoring practice and I went to Fairleigh Dickinson University and got certified as a tutor and a tutor trainer. From that time, that was about 2006, from that time, I've been tutoring students and also training tutors. And uh, it, the, the big, I'd say, step up is uh, getting the training in um, the science of reading through the letters training. Mm -hmm. And you and I both did this training. It's very rigorous. It involved a lot of reading. Uh, similarly to the training I had in, uh, uh, through the Orton Academy, I had two bookshelves full of books I had to read for that. And similarly, for letters, we did a lot of reading of academic articles. In addition to all the other knowledge that I had, this updated everything I knew mm -hmm. because I, I felt like when we were going through that training that um, there was a lot of new information since the 2000 uh, National Reading Panel that hadn't really got come through to the field. Mm -hmm. And that I felt was the difference with letters, that letters really started to bring more of that new information. And so that's my background. Yeah, and that's a really extensive, you know, background. Again, for those of you in the audience who may be professors or in the audience or educators or even moms at home who have background knowledge, you know, working with, you know, Cleve and, you know, just working with different educators in the field, as well as letters, you know, with Dr. Tolman, Dr. Motes. Um, you know, Emily has certainly had lots of training. And what I love, Emily, is that you've been able to see over the years, you know, what has been added. I feel like because of your deep knowledge, you're able to take these different areas and merge them 
in a way that makes it practical for teachers. And I think that's been really great, you know, because you've had all this training, sometimes you have a lot, but then it deepens your knowledge. But I think that's important too, just some of the things that I know you've even taught, shown, talked to us about, you know, even as consultants that you found working with some of those students this year. So I, I love that. What are the most important components of reading? It's interesting because we thought, we think about the components of reading in terms of the reading grove or the National Reading Panel, which came up with these five areas of reading. They include vocabulary comprehension, a phonemic awareness and phonological awareness, and decoding. And, and, and actually, I think that we've come down to a little bit different understanding because we have students whose you know, when we talk about vocabulary, what we're really talking about is, is probably the largest component of comprehension we now realize is background knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we talk about vocabulary, what we're really talking about is what do you know and what can you name? And how much of a picture of how the world works do you have mm -hmm. to recognize and fit in new information? And so building kids' background knowledge is very important for reading. And we also have come to this much firmer understanding of how uh, print maps onto speech mm -hmm. and therefore oral language ability uh, in listening comprehension and ability to express oneself using oral language are also very important components of learning to read. And so when you talk about reading skill, um, the decoding skill is very important and that there are components of that that are important. But what we're recognizing is those kids who've had the most difficulty being remediated for both decoding and comprehension, a lot of the time, one of the things that they're struggling with is just being able to express themselves using oral language and to understand what's coming in. And so my understanding of the basics of reading skills has changed over time. And what's interesting about it is, I think, um, when you talk about the kids being able to elaborate and explain things and use language to uh, describe their thinking, that there's a lot of convergence in the math literature. Mm -hmm. That's really good. And I, and I really like how you said, you know, you, your understanding has shifted, but the importance of oral language and really that background knowledge and bringing in those experiences. So I agree with you, Emily. I think those are really critical components. There's many, but really making sure that we are aware of that and how that it does impact our comprehension. I had a big insight at our PA literacy symposium because one of our focuses at the IU lately has been on trauma. Mm -hmm. And Stephen Dykstra did this presentation, and it was very powerful. And at the end of it, he said, so he's a, he, he does a lot of work with, um, you know, uh, emotional and uh, social emotional learning. And he said, if you want to help a child who has experienced trauma, teach them to read. Mm. And he was looking at reading as a piece of being able to make connections with your own emotions being able to process what has happened to you mm -hmm. and having a sense of, of connection to the ideas of others mm -hmm. through the ability to read and express yourself. And I thought that was very powerful. It was something I had not seen before, but he actually made that strong connection. He said that those um, children who learn to read have much better opportunity to overcome trauma in their back. And when you think about equity, you know, you, you mentioned equity. I think that's a big piece of it. Yeah. And that was a major insight for me that just happened like weeks ago. Mm. And I remember you sharing that quote with me, Emily, and that is powerful, you know, just the, just with that impact of trauma and how you said reading can help with processing. And again, you know, depending on that child, you know, as they're regulating from trauma, that reading component is important, you know, to give them that also helps. So I do love that. And I think that is important and thinking about that for our schools. And that's a whole big area, right? Look, looking at do all of our kids have access to all of the best reading instruction? I think that is a big loaded question. Um, so what about explicit reading instruction? Is that important for all students? 
it, it's important for all students, not all students need the same amount, maybe. Um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about explosive instruction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, what you're doing when you introduce key foundational understandings using explicit instruction is you make sure the kids get it and you make sure that the kids get it the way they need to understand it. They connect it to prior knowledge, explicitly connect it to prior knowledge. You tell them what it is, how it fits with everything else. And from that point, once you've got, and you have them practice it to mastery, and once they really have the foundational information, you can get into other kinds of inferential learning. Mm -hmm. But I think that the reason that explicit instruction is so important is you can't throw kids into higher cognitive, fun you know, uh, tasks that require higher cognitive function if they don't have the basics and you ensure that every kid has the basics the way they need to understand it and have the connections. Because um, even in uh, gifted education, you know, educating gifted learners, they need to learn information in such a way that they can make the connections. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it is important for all kids just to make sure that everyone's on this, literally on the same page, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think explicitness, and you know, again, Emily and I both teach <laughs> Um, adjunct professors and even for adults you know even when we're having trainings like we're always being cognitive of does is the, are the directions making sense as much as we do that sometimes it needs to be more explicit right or one group I'll do that and the next group like huh and so there you know and it could be the same content you know and Emily is nodding and that's why like that explicitness a lot of times I don't know about you Emily but we go into you know different classrooms and we've had the pleasure of going in there but understanding what explicit instruction means, right? And actually doing that in, in application is, is different, right? And so understanding that very, right? No, no second guessing. It's exactly what you're meaning for, this, for the other person to understand it. Yeah. And I think that you have to put your teacher ego aside. Yeah. If the, if the student is not getting it, you know, we have these highly intelligent kids in our graduate classes Absolutely. And if they're not getting it, it's because we didn't explain it. We need to re-explain it. Mm -hmm. It's like you have to take it on as a teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, um, over the years I've heard teachers say, and I hear it less now than I used to hear it, oh, I taught it, they didn't learn it. And if they didn't learn it, you didn't explain it uh, sufficiently. And I think that's part of, you know, when we talk about that importance of prior knowledge, mm -hmm. explicit instruction overcomes any gaps in prior knowledge because you are working with the kid to get it until they can fit it into their schema, their understanding of the world. And so, you know, that's exactly right. Explicitness is part, I mean, as a teacher, you're constantly having to go back and say, why didn't they understand this the way I expected them to? Yeah, yeah. And I feel like, you know, Emily, like just in general, you know, everywhere I go, even if it's at, you know, a car shop or if it's doing, you know, it's just second nature for me to be like, you know, can't necessarily say the keys are in the room, right? That's not explicit. The keys are on the table, you know, by, by the red chair, you know, you know, and, and that's that explicit, you know, and so Emily, you're right. Like we, and everybody's brilliant, you know, and even I've been in trainings, and Emily, you do, where, you know, everything's going well, but for whatever reason, the directions aren't clear. And that's where I love where you said, Emily, you know, we have to leave our ego at the door because we might have all the great plans, but, you know, they may not be understanding it, or maybe perhaps half of them are, but the other half isn't. So it still mean, means, means it needs to be more explicit. And I think that's just with education, right? We're constantly wanting to reflect and say, are they understanding? And if not, how can I keep improving it? So I love that, Emily. Yeah. What have you found effective in teaching reading? And I know you've mentioned some, but what have been most effective? I think that if I'm, if I'm bringing anything to this conversation that um, could be added to the science of reading, it would just be my background in uh, this very highly structured in, um, direct instructional techniques. Because I've done it uh, a lot myself and I've trained other people to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that the, uh, all the direct instruction components having a routine um, being systematic, meaning that you have um, a, a structured way of doing error correction, immediate error correction. Um, you have structures in place to make, you know, you have criteria for mastery. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, 
it's a way of approaching teaching that uh, has gotten a bad rap over the years. Um, it's, it, it doesn't have to be boring. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be engaging for the student or for the teacher, but the teacher has to be highly trained. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that the um, having a routine, having uh, an appropriate level of pacing so that you're getting through the information for, for, for so, so there are two pieces of the reading instruction. I think of it in two pieces. I think of the decoding piece and then I think of the um, comprehension piece. So the, the decoding piece, you really have to have automaticity in sound symbol associations. You have to have automaticity in spelling. Um, and you know you have to uh, have a kind of a phonological awareness, uh, uh, not just for the sounds of language, but also for the syntax of language. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you hear something, or you read something, it sounds right, or it looks right to you. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that uh, the, the routines that are involved in that can make the learning more uh, efficient. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of students um, there, there. So I have a couple of teachers who are long time literacy interventionists. Mm -hmm. They Both of them have been doing it at least as long as I have but they were, have been doing a traditional literacy intervention. And I trained them in Orton-Gillingham two years ago, and we were having kind of a debrief on what they've learned so far, and they've had to switch to online instruction. Mm -hmm. So a couple, um, they, they're both doing Title I intervention. And um, the one teacher started doing one-to-one -one with each of her students, and she said, it was amazing. There was a kid she'd had a small group instruction, and when she went to one-to-one, the kid made so much progress that she was able to take her out of Title I wow. reading instruction. And she said, I couldn't believe the kind of progress she was able to make in the smaller grouping with the more structured intervention. She just picked up stuff that she hadn't been able to pick up in small group. And what she felt probably was the reason was because she was the only one responding when they were doing the stimulus response part of like a reading dictation or a you know, reading, read, word reading or re, a spelling dictation. Mm -hmm. She said she wasn't able to rely on the other kids and for responding and listen to the other kids and follow that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the routines and having the appropriate level of uh, individualization and um, the small enough grouping uh, is a big piece of effective reading instruction to kind of get the kid on the decoding, get their decoding up to, to grade level so that they can then read grade level text for comprehension. That's great. And that's incredible. You know, and again, even seeing, like, I love your training of teachers and them seeing, right, the fruits of what, you know, they were learning and applying it, you know, and also like, you know, some of the things you I'm sure had modeled to them to say, this is, you know, some things to work for the student. And probably, you know, they may have been working with that student for a while, like you were saying, and they're like, oh my goodness, they're, they're making those gains. And so that's why, you know, when we're talking about teaching reading, it is, you know, uh, science and, you know, Emily, it's not, you know, it's so important. And I agree with you that teachers get the background. You know, there is a lot, you know, we had the letters training and Emily already was trained with that, but a lot of educators in Pennsylvania and in states hadn't had any background training besides just knowing the components of reading, but not really understanding why, right, we do decoding and why we have specific ways to teach reading to students, especially in the area of decoding. And so, Emily, I love, you know, hearing those success stories because that that's so important, you know, especially for the audience, you know, if there are moms or, you know, some of you as adults may also still, you know, not be as strong in those decoding skills. I know Emily has background with even helping adults and youth you know, continue to grow in their reading skills. So I really, again, if you have <laughs> that need or you, you're not believing that you can learn to read, you certainly can. Like, what are some practical ways for parents to work with their children? And I think that parents can help their kids develop background knowledge mm -hmm. and their oral language skills. I think you want to listen to them, to converse with them, I think that it's important to let them try things out with language, play with language, singing and, you know, rhyming and mm -hmm. rhyming, rhyming books. You know, they tell you to read to your kid, but, mm -hmm. you know, in those, all those studies of kids' vocabulary size when they 
um, enter school age, a lot of it's focused on just how much direct, you know, um, interaction do you have with your caregivers. Mm -hmm. And so what you're really doing is you're, you're both speaking to them and listening to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that that direct interaction is a powerful preparation for reading. Mm -hmm. um, you can model reading, you can, but I think playing with language is so much fun. Mm -hmm. Singing and puns and humor and, you know, all of the kind of things that we do culturally, maybe a little differently in different cultures, mm -hmm. can then enrich the child's understanding of language in general. Mm -hmm. And that can be a powerful preparation for them. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly it. And I like that you said about bringing in that cultural background and those experiences, right? And that is also a way to infuse that and, and really as a parent to bring in, right, the whole picture for that child and really as a family, right, be able to connect and build connections. I love that. Well, I was watching, uh, they, they just released this film of Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And I was watching Hamilton and I was thinking, fabulous uses of language, mm -hmm. powerful communication and it makes you want to stand up and dance it makes you want to learn the words of the raps mm. and men rapping and have men rapping and it's about all different kinds of things and i was thinking what powerful language use and how engaging it is you know it doesn't matter what kind of thing it is if it's a dr seuss book or if it's you know an old old style european nursery rhyme all of those things are preparation for reading and they're fun and they're, they're a way of connecting with kids that I think, you know, parents can enjoy and kids can enjoy. Yeah, and I love how you said, you know, reading should be fun. It should be, have enjoyment, you know, have discussions about what you're learning. And even, you know, with watching things such as Hamilton, you know, talking about the language. I love how you said, you know, the powerful language that you're hearing, the communication skills and how to interact with words. That's really it really can be fun. And so for some of you out there that aren't sure, you know, again, what resources, and we will talk about some more, but, you know, again, be encouraged, you know, whether you have a few books or you have many, use any of those sources to be able to talk or, or interact with your children and bring in your culture. And Emily, are there any additional practical ways to teach reading that we may not have talked on that you wanted to highlight? We want to expose them to text uh, we want to read, you know, things with them, mm -hmm. um, you know, talk about the stop sign says, st uh, mm -hmm. you know, talk about how you can separate out the sounds in words or the uh, segment syllables and words. You know, there were, there are a lot of songs like where you play on someone's name, mm -hmm. um, you know, talk about, you know, uh, how, you know, how letters are formed, um, you know, just playing with drawing, you know, have kids sign their drawings and teach them how to write their name. Um, I think, you know, getting them comfortable with writing and, and writing, le making letter shapes and that kind of thing. Um, just reinforcing what they're getting at school. Yeah. Uh, show me what you did today. Show me how you make that letter you know, and uh, oh, that's cool. Can you show me again? Let's trace it, you know, um, those kinds of things. Uh, yeah. It's really about, you know, connecting with the kids on what are they learning? And, and if they can explain it to you, then you know they've learned it. So. Yeah, and I like that, you know, again, practical, like show me, right? Can you show me, you know, show me, let's do that together, right? Anything that gets a student to be able to have the action, right, or actually tell you back. That's great, Emily. Well, I thought it was kind of an adolescent thing that you would ask kids what happened at school today, and they'll say, eh, nothing, you know. But it's actually little kids, too. Like, you have to ask specific questions. Mm -hmm. What did you learn today? What did you learn about letters today? What did you learn about reading today? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what did you read in school today? Oh, tell me that story. Mm -hmm. You know, you really have to kind of, like, I used to say they would give me name, rank, and serial number. <laughs> you have to kind of, you have to kind of dig in there. Well, what, you know, what's happening in your life, you know? And uh, I think all of that is helpful. Yeah, some of that explicitness, right? There's no guessing if you're like, you know, what happened during that, you know, geometry, you know, today versus what did you do today? Yeah, so I like that, Emily. 
And that's hopefully helpful for some of you in the audience that are struggling to try to figure out from your adolescents or your kids, right? Like, oh my gosh, they're just saying it was okay. <laughs> well, so and to be honest, as a parent of a kid with special needs, mm -hmm. I knew on Tuesday I would ask, so did you see Mr. Grasso today? Yeah. The speech and language pathologist. Oh, what did you do with Doc, with Ms. Dr. Grasso today? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you want to also make connections to their special services that they're getting. And that's a really good, that's a really powerful point. Thank you. And so thinking about, you know, again, the topic of reading and explicit scientific reading, in, when you have, you know, different people that may not believe it's necessary to explicitly instruct students, and again, you mentioned that there's different doses based on individual needs, you know, what would you, you know, share with maybe say parents or anybody out there that's like, mm, I'm not sure if just doing, ex you know, explicit instruction is necessary. Perhaps we should just, you know, read and you can learn. <clears throat> well, one of the things that has become very clear uh, in the literature and our understanding of how students read, how anybody learns to read. Now, we've been able to confirm uh, hypotheses that were uh, put together in two, the 2000s and 2010s, um, we've been able to confirm a lot of the hypothesis with um, functional magnetic resonance imaging of reading brains. And we know that uh, there are connections that are made between activation areas in the brain that are made for everybody who learns to read. And you can, you can make those connections inferentially about 40 to 50% of us can do that. Mm -hmm. And so that means that just exposing um, a good number of us to text, we learn how to read, we make all the connections in our neural circuits that we need to, but we're processing the same way you would process if you had explicit phonics instruction. Mm -hmm. And so we, over the years, about 50% of kids have just struggled and struggled to learn to read if, because we haven't been addressing that. Mm -hmm. We felt, oh, we're teaching 40 to 50% of kids to read successfully, therefore we've taught them to read. But what we were really doing was taking credit for teaching something that we made, you know, that we learned inferentially. And Amanda and I, you know, we have talked about this. I don't remember learning to read. I didn't require explicit instruction. I put two and two together, and some of us are wired that way. Mm -hmm. But a good number of us are not wired mm -hmm. to make the inferences necessary to get beyond a fourth grade level of reading. Mm -hmm. And we used to call that, as people reading at a fourth grade level or below, functionally illiterate. Mm -hmm. It means you can't access understanding of uh, more complex texts including something like a newspaper article. So, uh, you know, though there are those of us in the society who could left on their own and without explicit instruction make it, um, we want to make sure that everybody has those skills. Um, did I answer the question? I, I mean, I think that was, you know, you know, people weren't understanding. I think you did because you were talking about, you know, the fMRIs and just validating that you know, when we use, you know, the appropriate phonological awareness, you know, instruction, and we use instruction targeted for, right, skills that that student may need, we're finding based on those brain image, right, scans that, yes, like, you know, and like you said, from instruction from one place, like even looking at where they were to meet two or three months even of remediation, you know, some of, you know, Nancy Hennessy, you know, like their work in different places where they're showing there's growth. So I'm like, yeah. So, you know, four parents are like, nope. You know, and like you also said, there might be some students that, you know, naturally pick up a lot of these skills, but not everybody does. And we do need some level, most people, you know, of explicit instruction in different areas. And once you pick it up, then you can go into deeper skills. And I think, um, you know, um, that's where sometimes when you have people say, well, I just picked it up. You know, maybe you were a parent, you're an educator that just picked it up, you know, like Emily said. But not everybody does, and there are certain things that need to be taught. So, you know, again, Emily, I do think you did. I don't know if there's anything that you're thinking while I'm talking, but you certainly. Well, there's there there are complicating factors. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we know that um, there we know that there are kids who are highly intelligent, 
and they can put they can make it look like they're understanding what they're reading even if their reading is very inaccurate mm -hmm. and we learned about the those people out of the Kilpatrick um, talked about compensators mm -hmm. so there are kids that uh, there's a kid I was tutoring last year who was uh, highly intelligent mm -hmm. and able to read connected text better than he could read individual word lists mm -hmm. and he had a lot of decoding issues but he was putting together the comprehension using um, picture cues and you know word prediction and that kind of thing well one of the big problems with reading instruction is that there was a whole area of research where they believed that that was how people read mm -hmm. that you start with the context of what you're reading and then you fill in the blanks and you do prediction they called it the um what do they call that they called it the guessing game yeah right they called it a guessing game they said yeah. we're predicting what word comes next and in fact that's not how proficient readers read Mm -hmm. it's it's not a good way to go and it's the reason a lot of us didn't you know there are a whole lot of us in the society that never got to uh, a sufficient level of reading to do college and, and to do in the in more complex reading um, and but I would caution parents there is a time limit here uh, basic research done by the Shaywitz mm -hmm. um, back in uh, the 2000s showed that the pathway to remediation was much harder after the age of eight changing the neural pathways uh, if you if you image the brains of strugg struggling readers before and after remediation before the age of eight students brains uh, were indistinguishable from students who were able to learn to read without that explicit instruction but after the age of eight, the pathway to reading is lengthened and it doesn't become as automatic as easily as before that time. And they actually quantify the amount of time an intervention doubles mm -hmm. uh, for older students. So you, if you have a, a child who, who has trouble with letter recognition, who has trouble with rhyming and segmenting sounds and, and, and words, um, or they have dysgraphia, they have difficulty, um, you know, producing uh, legible writing. You want to get them into some uh, intervention right away because it's much easier to remediate that. They may never remember that they had trouble learning to read if, they're re if all of those um, indicators are addressed very early on. Yeah. And so you want to get the kids, it's not to say you can't remediate reading after the age of eight, but it's just so much less time and effort intensive yeah. before that time. Absolutely, and those are good points, you know, Emily, to, for you know, audi those in the audience, you know, parents or those who didn't know that, you know, these are really important because it is, reading is critical. And, you know, the earlier we get the you know, intervention, the better, um, as Emily has mentioned. So thank you, Emily, for that. And so looking, and I know you mentioned, you know, um, David Kilpatrick, but Emily, if you can, you just share some resources for the audience to learn more about the science of reading? Um, well, there are kind of levels of it. Mm -hmm. um, there are some great videos uh, for people who don't, uh, you know, feel that they need to have a deep understanding of it. If they want to have a good comprehensive understanding without, a, a, you know, doing a lot of uh, scholarly reading. Mm -hmm. um, reading Rockets site has a lot of great videos about reading on it um ld online has a lot of good resources for parents mm -hmm. uh reading rockets in particular has a lot of, of very up-to-date information on it um and uh there is so so we talk about david kilpatrick there's there's older school um, there's older school, longer term, uh, basic science of reading mm -hmm. that you could read. That's a lot, it's a lot more on the scholarly level. It's a lot more for practitioners. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, um, there's also now good compendia of mm -hmm. the research. Yeah. So you don't have to go back and read all of the whole bookshelves that I had to read. Mm -hmm. to get the basics and get it all put together well. And the essentials of assessing and preventing, what is it, uh, assessing, preventing, and overcoming reading difficulties, 
I think this is very readable mm -hmm. for a college level reader. Yeah. Um, this is very complete. It's good information. But if you want this information in an even more readable form, more condensed form, his book, Equipped for Reading Success, this is um, uh, kind of expensive. It's a $50 book. But what this has is it has the science of reading information in about 40 pages. Uh, let's see. Well, maybe it's more like... Um, the first 40 pages are a good compendium, and then when you get to the back part of the book, it gives you um, activities for phonological awareness. But if, if you could access the this to read about it, this gives you all the basic background we've been talking about just now. Um, for more uh, in, in intensive scholarly kind of reading, um, the speech to print by mm -hmm. uh, Louisa Motes um, has been updated. Um, this was probably the foundational text um, for the science of reading. Uh, it's, a, it's been around for uh, many decades. I was uh, reading and teaching this book back in the 2000s. Um, and then she wrote the letters program, uh, like it was 2005 or something that it was yeah. originally published. Mm -hmm. um, there are other sources of information. You want to be careful mm -hmm. that what you're looking at is based on the science. So if you're if you find a book about reading and it doesn't have scholarly references in it, uh, you know if it isn't on a list of uh, recommended reading, like if it isn't listed in the if you look at you scroll down to the bottom of an article in something like. Um, uh, LD online or mm -hmm. reading rockets if you don't see you know scholarly references there it's probably not great information um, there is a book that's self-published by William Van Cleve called everything you want to know and exactly where to find it he self-publishes this this has all the information about the rules mm -hmm. and the you know all of the generalizations he has information about um, morphology in here um, and this is a good basic text, which gives you both the information and it tells you all the places, all the different um, series of books and structural materials here that you can use to support teaching uh, each of the generalizations. Um, so uh, those are the ones. There's, there's some older Orton Gillingham books that are fine. Uh, but there is updated information, and these are, uh, that I've shown you, as you know, these are the ones that have the most updated information that have been kept up. Absolutely. And they're doing, they're doing a reading of speech to print for uh, those of us who are certified in letters. Yeah. They're doing that through the patent right now, our, our Pennsylvania training uh, um, uh, agency. Yeah. So it's, it's that up-to-date kind of information. Great, and those are excellent, you know, resources that Emily has shown you again for different types of audiences, you know, whether it be parents or educators, administrators, again, look on into it. I will list those resources. Those are wonderful, Emily. And Emily, it's been amazing, you know, hearing all of your knowledge today. And I'd like you, you know, you've definitely given us more than the one dose of wisdom today in all you've learned. But is there one wisdom tip that you want to leave with the audience today about t reading instruction? I would say that there is no more efficient way to get information than reading. You can't get the same volume of information by listening or watching videos. If you wanna have highly informed, highly trained people, if you wanna have connections to your social, emotional, and inner life, if you wanna be able to do something like dive into a text and escape through that and learn about other periods in history, you have to have that reading scope. There, there's no substitution for reading and accommodating a reading difficulty can interfere with the kids learning to read. Mm -hmm. In order to read, you have to in, learn, learn to read better, you have to read. And so there isn't anybody, and I think I heard you say this, we have learned in all of our training that there's nobody who can't learn to read. 
right? If you have a human brain, you can learn to read. Yes. And it doesn't matter your intellectual functioning. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, any of these other things. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is we need to keep at the skill, keep teaching students until they have the skill. And we're not going to say that this kid can't read. We're going to say they can't read yet. And I guess that's my takeaway, is there's no substitution for proficient reading skill in terms of taking in information and pushing forward the boundaries, the frontiers of understanding. And so the ability to communicate through text is that important to human knowledge, and that is something we should expect and work for for all of our kids. Yeah, so thank you, Emily. So that's a lot, you know, if you, like, share, subscribe. Also, if you enjoyed hearing what Emily had to say about reading, you can tune in again because we will have another segment where Emily's going to talk about math, right? The importance of teaching mathematics skill. And I'm sure you'll be able to hear some even more greater levels of wisdom from Emily at that time. So thank you, Emily. It was a pleasure talking thank to you. Me. And thank you everybody for listening or watching today. And I hope you have a great week and I'll see you tomorrow for more Daily Dose of Wisdom.